not localized properly, it may go out. And secondly, if the patient is having specific tenderness along the biceps tendon, it's hard, you know, have you injected really in and around the sheath or not? So I think these are the two places, if you're not really very sure, you can take the help of sonologists. I agree. But the SUMAC and ACJs, I think without doubt we can... Uh, just a in. comment. Uh, in Brazil, we are focusing a, a, a lot of attention on, on PRP. But the problem is that we have a lot of financial limitations and uh, constraints. But I have done in my office in the last two years only four cases, like like you, 45-year-old patient with very, very discreet hair, some impingement, but the phoenix was, was evident. And they came to me because they are reading in the literature on, on the internet. And I said, I cannot give you big guarantees because the, the papers are coming, we can do it, but don't, don't blame me if this does not work. And in fact, all of them are wonderful and nice. I, I tell so all my patients I can I, guarantee anything, yeah. but it works. Yeah, but I'm happy to see that my patients are, are, are having so many re results, but this is not a coincidence, you're having the same. Yeah, and one thing I think that we have to be aware of is to tell the patients, that unlike with steroids, the steroids usually is painful for a couple of days and then they're better. They may be painful for two weeks, so sure. they may hate you for two weeks, sure. but then it starts to, because it works in a different way. It starts the, all the inflammation again. The combination of hydrocortisone, the contact is and it helps. What, with? With? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't find much in that, but it's, it's an option. Do you recommend this injection for the acute supraspinatus calcific tendonitis? It's very painful, acute stage. Do you recommend this injection for that? Which definitely is steroid. Sure. Steroid. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You are you. Your patient will think that you are a magician. Sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. In acute cases, it can be used. Can I just comment on two cautions yeah. for any injections? Please don't use only alcohol wipes. Use a chlorhexidine with alcohol or betadine with alcohol. Because even for putting a cannula now, the guidelines is to use a chlorhexidine wipe. Why on the joint? That's one. Secondly, whenever you inject steroids in a diabetic, tell them that the sugar level goes up for two weeks. Two weeks, <laughs> yeah, sure. Because that is when they can go into keto acidosis. Those are very, very important to tell the patient. None of them tell them. That's very important. That's Absolutely. one take home thing. And the third thing is, the target of the injection does not matter because for it to be effective as an anti-inflammatory, there was a randomized trial in BNJ looking at subacral injection and a buttock injection. It had the same effect. I think the idea of doing the injection is to know the diagnosis. If it yeah. works immediately, that you yeah, know it is there, yes. there is another point. This study that everyone quotes from the BMJ, I think there's a major flaw in this study. <laughs> and the flaw is that the patients, actually all the patients, actually got uh, um, injection into the cervical bursa with local anesthetic. So obviously it works the same because the steroid you can put anywhere. But the important big bit is to inject the local anesthetic to break the vicious circle of pain in order for the, for the short yeah. to, re, for to do the yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, as a even as a shoulder arthroscopist, basically, um, I, uh, it was a bit wishy-washy all throughout when I used to inject as he showed the glenohumeral joint from behind, even with a large needle as such, whether I was actually in the glenohumeral or not. And uh, does anybody kind of find it easier, um, just the anterior inferior portal route? Uh, you are certainly into the joint for sure. Uh, is it any better or, uh, I mean, or you you're, pretty con you're pretty confident with the posterior route? I think I ant anterior approach I find is easier than the posterior one. So the anterior is yeah. The anterior is easier. I think, yeah. easier. I think the patients hate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The with the anterior I prefer to do it from the back. The, the most tender area on the shoulder is around the coracoid, and you're putting a big needle just right to the coracoid, they hate it. And again, I've found that when you inject more from the back, you need a little bit of maneuvering like you do for a glenohumeral arthroscopy, but once you Make sure that you're in your joint. That's and you feel all, yeah. the pop, and uh, you, you, can, yeah. you can get in there. But just, but just one thing is that you may use a 14 uh, spinal needle instead of, of a, a small, a small mm -hmm. one. Yeah, yeah. So you, you, you take it to the, the 
the office, you put sterile uh, gloves, and then you inject exactly like you're doing a endoscopy to inflate the joint. And again, you don't. You need to have no resistance when you yeah. inject it. Yeah. Okay. So as you mentioned, the, uh, sometimes deep pigmentation of the skin. Uh, if, if it's it superficial, ah, uh, if it's superficial. So sometimes white patch appears. Yeah. Is it require any medicine or it will subside? It, it won't subside. It usually remains. No, I, I think six months to one year, the uh, deep pigment, uh, pigmentation no. starts coming back, and by one year, most of them. Uh, it is atrophy of the fat. Usually the fat uh, gets atrophied and. and like demyelination of the uh, skin. Sorry. I think it's more with repeated injections, yes, especially no. around the elbow if you wear special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four and tennis elbow injections, yeah, the other yeah. ones. Yeah. 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 For decurrence, yeah. usually you get this type of deep condition. To locate the exact strength of the needle, we can even use the image under image. Even uh, ultrasound, you can't. So, we, uh, as I have to finish here, we always have image. We can image to locate the exact yeah, th yeah. yeah, the purpose is accurate placement. You yeah. Yeah. And you take the patient from your office to wherever your image is. The image is not the purpose of injecting in the office. Sure. Any experience on suprascapular nerve? Suprascapular nerve block is the easiest block you can do. Sure. If you know the anatomy, it's very simple. You know, I can teach you in, in, in one sentence now. You find the the um, nervosa portal, the the gap between the, the posterior clavicle and the and the cornea, <coughs> and then you take a needle and you go straight down. You hit the bone, you pull back a touch, and you inject. And again, 99 out of 100, you do the block. No, I would agree with that, because I use it as for my post-op analgesia. Mm -hmm. I don't rely on any interscaping blocks by the anesthetist. <coughs> I use a superscapular nerve block yeah. and local infiltration. And we've just looked at our figures. We have patients as satisfied as with the You recommend it for pathologies in, in your own clinic for <coughs> frozen shoulders in your Well, frozen shoulders, my philosophy is completely different, so I don't do any super stuff in nerve loss with them. But it, it's a very good pain relief modality, and as I said, I use it for all my shoulder surgery, arthroscopic mm -hmm. shoulder surgery. Even during the surgery, you can use it so yeah. that that will prevent the uh, BP fluctuation because the pain response is less. Uh, you can use it. You can use it for different pathologies as well. I mean, if I have patients coming with uh, some <coughs> long-term pain and all that, you can inject them again and this break the vicious circle of pain. So you do that in your opinion on your clinic or you in a clinic? It's very simple. With with steroid? With steroid, yeah. Local anesthetic and steroid. Yeah. The important thing about the injections, uh, just to, to add as a comment, is the volume. Because I have patients coming uh, after the GP has injected their shoulder, and it didn't work. It didn't work because he injected the one cc of, of, of no, no, one cc of of, uh, of local anesthetic and steroid together. This, you know, it's 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 like a drop in the ocean. I mean, it goes down into the bursa down here, doesn't do anything. It's important to inject the volume, at least the 10 mils together. And another important <coughs> thing is to manipulate the arm at the time of the injection, after the injection, to spread it all around. Ask the patient to bend over to do a bit of pendulum movement and all that, and then ask the patient to try, and do, to, try to do the movement was most painful before. Sure. And usually he said, wow. This is the anesthetic. Great, yeah. But then you know yeah. that if, even if you have to operate on this patient, the operation will be successful. But this is for the <coughs> This is for impingement. Or for AC joint. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. I think uh, that generated the maximum discussion because that's what we all kind of uh, do very often. Thank you so much. For thank, you. Thank, you, thank, thank you. 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 I think with that, we have exhausted all our uh, questions on this session. So I may thank my co chairperson and the organizer for giving us the opportunity to end this session, first session. Thank you very much, uh, Offer and Pratik.
and uh, that was quite an interactive uh, uh, basic discussion as such, which always helps. Uh, I would now invite uh, Sergio Rubinsky and Vivek Pandey <coughs> to chair the next session. And uh, this is, again, a session on evaluation. Um, don't jump into operating, but evaluate uh, before you can kind of get a hang of things as to uh, how focused you are during surgery as such. It all goes into planning rather than, you know, just uh, uh, deciding once the scope is in. Thanks, Amit, for uh, inviting me back. And I look forward to every opportunity to come back to uh, India. And uh, greetings from the north of Scotland, where I am currently. And I probably st feel like a bit of a fraud standing here talking about radiological evaluation decision making because mm -hmm. I'm not a radiologist. But anyway, maybe uh, I will see. So what I thought was, I said, what am I going to talk about? And it's very interesting that I come and do occasionally some clinical work in India, and the first investigation, and the only investigation I see is an MRI scan. I think patients in India, must there must be the highest per capita rate of MRI scanning in the world. Because every patient demands an MRI scan, every patient wants you to organize an MRI scan, and every shoulder surgeon does an MRI scan. And it's interesting when you see people with adhesive capsulitis capsul with an MRI scan in their hand. So I thought, no, I need to think about it. So the diagnosis depends on history, examination, and I think that by this stage you should have your diagnosis. And then the investigations come. Okay. So when we are looking for clues in decision making, the first, the most important clues come from the history and examination. And the investigations are just there to confirm what you have already diagnosed. As I said, an investigation is not to diagnose, it is to confirm what you have already diagnosed. Plan your surgical treatment and look for the unexpected. This is the point. Sorry. And look for the unexpected. This is one of my anesthetic colleagues who had been on a holiday swimming a lot, came back and said, you know what, I've got a bit of impingement pain. Can you inject my shoulder? And I x-rayed him and I found this lesion in the distal end of his clavicle, which was a solitary myeloma deposit. And you ended up using a bone marrow transplant. So again, just think before you get your needle out or you inject or whatever. So, but plain radiographs tell you a lot. So my standard views in my clinic are an AP and auxiliary view. I get confused by the number of radiological projections that the Rockwood and Green's book tells me about, and I really don't know what I'm going to learn from them. Okay. An AP view can show you a spur. And the reason I get an auxiliary view is to look for this fellow, the osochromiale. And this is a young lady who came to me with shoulder pain, and she had a large osochromiale, and I wasn't sure whether the pain is from the osochromiale or she's got impingement. So this is the only one that I've ever fused, and it did fuse, and its symptoms went away. So uh, an auxiliary view in my book is probably one of the most important views apart from a standard AP view. You can get these fancy outlet views to look at the acromial morphology, and if it changes your practice, well, good luck. I think you can see most of these spurs when you go in and find and do an arthroscopy. So uh, if you've got resources and you want to subject your patient to radiation, or you're doing a study, that's fine. You can use these views. But you can identify, we talked about the calcific tendinitis. You don't need an MRI scan. To, in fact, it, the MRI scan doesn't pick up a calcific deposit. So you need a plain X-ray. Somebody coming with an acute painful shoulder, please get a plain F film. It's quick. It occurs in within, you can get it within a few minutes, and you can find this large fella. And you can, if you need to, you can do that. Again, AVN, you can pick it up on, an MRI, uh, on a straightforward uh, plain x-ray. If the x-ray is normal and you still have suspicion, then an MRI would be useful in the earlier stages. But you can pick up an, uh, an AVN on, this is a guy who's 35, treated for leukemia bilateral AVN. We ended up doing surface replacements on him and did quite well after that. Arthritis of any description you can pick up on plain radiographs. This is pure osteoarthritis. That's a cuff deficient shoulder, cuff tear arthropathy. Again, plain radiographs are adequate to uh, diagnose and confirm. 
There was a bit of a debate about ultrasound and discussion about ultrasound guided uh, injections. I find the, an ultrasound scan in my clinic the most useful investigative tool after I've had the plain radiographs. Because between my clinical examination and ultrasound examination, I can probably reasonably diagnose up to about 90% <coughs> with 90% accuracy whether the patient has got a cuff tear or not. I probably wouldn't go as far, you know, whether I can exactly say how big a partial thickness tear is, but we can reasonably diagnose these tears. It's non-invasive, there's no radiation, and it's accessible to me in the outpatient clinic. And I think, and it's, especially in the NHS where you're worried about costs, it saves the patient from coming back and forth after results of an investigation. It's quite useful. Is it accurate? These two studies seem to suggest that it's as accurate as an MRI scan to confirm a rotator cuff tear. And probably in the Indian setting, it's much cheaper to get an ultrasound than to get an MRI scan. But a word of caution, you need to pick up your ultrasonologist. Or right? <laughs> or do it yourself. The guy who does a lot of obstetric ultrasounds is probably not going to pick up a carotid cuff tear, okay? He'll be looking for a baby there. Not even a mess. <laughs> so uh, if you can do it yourself, it's a, it's a skill that you pick up, and as you practice, you get better, and you get a diagnosis there and then, and you can counsel your patients effectively. I do get MRI scans occasionally. In one of the private hospitals where I have, I don't have an ultrasound machine, so I get an MRI scan. And it tells me, you know, the large full thickness tear or a partial thickness tear. Again, if you don't have access to an ultrasound or, or a good ultrasonologist, then probably an MRI scan. A plain MRI scan is good to pick up these cuff tears. Although partial thickness tears, sometimes maybe an MR orthogram might be better to pick up a partial thickness tear. MR orthogram, good at picking up labral lesions. So that's a case with an anterior labral tear and a slap lesion there. This is a lady who fell off a horse and the horse stamped the front of her shoulder and shoulder dislocated and she had an extensive posterior in labral tear which I fixed recently. I find a CT scan to be very useful at times when I'm looking to assess the bone stock that's available. Now this is instability or a glenoid fracture and you want to quantify whether you're going to do a bony procedure or a soft tissue procedure not clearly not suitable for a soft tissue procedure here. You've lost significant amount of glenoid. So that's where I use a CT scan. Or in the arthroplasty situation, this is a patient with massive cuff tear arthropathy, significant glenoid erosion and you have to devise your strategy what you're going to do with this rather than just putting in a reverse. You need, you need to judge the adequacy of the bone stock that's available. So I'll take you through what my algorithm for uh, most of the patients is. As Sergio said, you know, what do the patients come with? I look at my patients, how they come to me. They either come to me with my shoulder hurts, my shoulder hurts and doesn't move, or it moves too much. If it hurts and doesn't move, I get an AP and auxiliary view. If it's normal and it clinical diagnosis, you're heading towards an adhesive capsulitis. If you're suspecting cuff pathology, now that is, when I say cuff pathology, I'm going through the whole spectrum from an impingement right up to uh, uh, massive tears or whatever. I'll do an ultrasound in the clinic and occasionally an MRI scan if I'm worried about how large the tear is, whether it's gone beyond the glenoid, whether I want to look at the fat infiltration, etc. Then I will do an MRI scan. If I have arthritis, most of the times clinically you can judge whether you've got a functioning cuff tear or not. Do an ultrasound in the clinic. Occasionally I'll do an MRI to, if I'm still worried about the cuff before I proceed to do what kind of arthroplasty am I going to do. And I'll do a CT scan, especially if I plain radiograph suggest a bone loss because again to plan my surgery. As you can see, nothing that I'm doing here is making a diagnosis. It's all confirming my clinical diagnosis. Instability, again, I'll start with a plain radiograph. You'll pick up a hill sacs lesion. Occasionally, you'll see bony glenoid, bony defects. Beware, beware of the double shadow of the inferior glenoid that you see. You know, you're looking at a bony bank cart lesion. If the patient has had a radiological or documented dislocation, and my plain radiographs don't show me any bony defects, I really don't bother with an MR orthogram. The patient's got a labral injury. There's no bony injury, I'll go and scope. Very rarely you go in and you find no soft tissue, the soft tissue is poor, but the MR orthogram doesn't even tell you that whether the quality of the soft tissue. So I won't waste time and money on that, I'll go for surgery. If I suspect bony defects on the plain radiographs, 
I try and get an MRI through them because in most of them you can look at bony lesions, especially if you get an on fast view of the glenoid, then you don't really need to do a CT scan. If I still don't have the information and still I'm concerned, then I'll do a CT scan. The worry, what worries me is when the patients come that they feel their shoulders coming in and out, but you've never got a radiologically documented dislocation. And that in my book is definitely a prime indication to get an MR, MR arthrogram because you don't know whether it's labral pathology, what kind of labral pathology they have, or if they've got a cuff tear, okay? So that is where I'll get an MR arthrogram. So to summarize, there is a lot of number of imaging tools that are available to you, but they're only to assist you. They're not to dictate what you do. They're to confirm your clinical suspicions, and all of us should have the clinical acumen to diagnose most of the shoulder conditions that we see but always beware the unexpected like that. And I've seen two metastatic lesions in the shoulder who presented to me with impingement. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Kapil, for a comprehensive talk. Um, I have a couple of uh, yeah. queries. <coughs> for the benefit of audience and for me, of course, <coughs> What is your investigation of choice in a patient who is who comes to you with a degrade dislocation of shoulder without any bony band art seen on an X-ray? As I said, if they have got a radiologically documented dislocation in the past, and let us say that the dislocation is, if it's been in the last year or two, they've had two dislocations or three dislocations, then I will not do it. Apart from the plain radiographs, I'll just go and straight with stabilization surgery. I won't do any MR arthrograms. Uh, no CT? No. If I cannot see any bony lesions, I'll probably not do a CT. But are we sure just by looking at an X-ray that the, you know, the, the, the defect is less than 20%? If it's a very high demand person, even if you know, there are parts that 15 person also should be yeah, I, I take your point, but I'll do an intra. I, when I do an arthroscopic stabilization, I always tell the patient that I'll go and assess the bone and the soft tissues, both of them, and if I cannot do a soft tissue procedure safely, then I'll do a lateral J. You will convert. Right? Yes. But, it will, but then you, you would make an intra op decision. Yep. Uh, when you decide to do the MR arthrogram, uh, especially for the labral tears, do you just do the plain MR arthro or you do the Aber views? I, uh, my radiologist does all of them, so we do the Aber views as well. Yeah. Just. Just a word of caution about the, the ISIS score that um, you had mentioned. Yeah. And I, I think, I mean, the French are really pushing hard for the lateral jail. And I mean, in my practice, which is a very uh, quick practice, I'm, I keep the lateral jail for the, for the revision cases or for the cases that are significant bone loss. Yeah. And if you follow the ISIS score, and it was the American, the last closed meeting of the American Children and Health Society, one day, I can't remember exactly who from the Americas did try to validate the IC score and he found that this is really too strict score. So if you have a young patient with, again, we have a young patient, plays rugby, he will have a, a latter jet no matter what, what bone, bone loss no. is caused. You know? So I think it's far too much and, and I think we have to be very cautious about using it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the my threshold of doing a latter J is very small. What's your definition of significant bone loss? And does it does it vary from age and you know demand? It's like if a ten percent bone loss may be very significant for a high velocity, I mean you know rugby player, but a ten percent bone loss in a simple office goal may not be a great loss. But in, in my philosophy, it's it's I mean again thirty percent thirty percent of, of bone loss of the glenoid is significant. Okay, so for you it's 30 percent. But you have to, to remember that if you have a, a very young child coming to, to your office and he's, he's a sportsman, but he's not an elite sportsman. He's going to do the, the recreational sports and all that, and he's got 25 percent loss. I prefer to do an anatomical reconstruction and to tell him that it may not work rather than to do a destructive operation that if this fails, you are in trouble. Big, big trouble. I think so, and, and I, and to be honest, I had to revise so many of these latages in the recent years, done wrongly, done poorly, with patients that develop arthritis in their early 30s, 
because of the of the latches they're putting in the wrong position, the wrong prominent, position. the screws in the joint and all this. I, I, I just a word of caution, that's all. Okay, can I just make a small comment? In Brazil we do a lot of restores some latages. So my uh, uh, my my ex uh, uh, chief is a very famous guy in doing in doing restores and I have done many, many, many with very, very, very few complications. But as he used it to say, the complications can be big disasters if you're not doing it properly. So the thing is, once you are doing the Bristol, I don't do the Latarge, I do Bristol's. But honestly speaking, I have made probably more than 30 and with regular, very good results, but there are a lot of tips, uh, tricks, uh, specific uh, things to do. And if you do, if you put the graft a little bit more lateral, then you, you will have the famous impingement between the head and the anterior part of the graft. And then you will have the most complication of the surgery that is arthritis that is uh, sometimes even in five years, in 10 years, the patient is 35 and, the, and, and, that, and that shoulder is gone. But once you do it properly, uh, results are very, very fine. fine. I, I have already seen uh, two or three patients with maybe 17, 20 years post Bristol uh, in, in university with absolutely no, no arthritis. So Gilles Vauch, the father of the issue, the pope of the, of the, the issue, he was in Brazil two times and he said, uh, you can do a Bristol or a lateral jig for any shoulder instability, even after the first episode. But I think that this is overkill. You should do it when you have a 25%, a 30% uh, defect, and you have to understand who is, is your patient. But uh, uh, just to, to conclude, uh, uh, well done, it's a very, very safe surgery. On a very basic note, what is the take-home message for the audience? Uh, is an MRI ever required in a proven recurrent dislocator uh, where you're not suspecting glenoid bone loss at all or human head bone loss? I think that's a very difficult question to answer. And without sounding very controversial, I think a plain MRI scan is of no use. If you really go to the image, you do an MRI arthrogram or you go on your clinical instincts and your arthroscopy. So I yeah, think if, if there was a take-home message that I would say, please don't waste time and money on yeah, a plain just, MRI just, scan. Just a very serious and practical comment. I don't know what are your problems, you're from Scotland, with medical legal issues. This is a mess in the United States, and unfortunately, this is uh, coming to Brazil. So I have, I have, I, I want to see a backward lesion, uh, and uh, in an MRI, even if, if I saw a dislocated shoulder in, a, in an APX ray view, but I have to defend myself as any doctor in my country, medical legally, uh, with with this exam. So you 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 may say this is overkill, but I have to defend. Well, it's the same so out here. Yeah, the, 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 the same out here. The insurance company will not pay for the patient. And even and even and even a hundred percent of insurance companies of my country, the best ones and the lowest ones. Without an MRI report, they will never, ever allow me to do this surgery. We are still not in that situation. Yeah. In the UK, we are okay. We are better. We are in a better position. I, yes. I think, Kapil, uh, we'll just uh, finish with one note. Uh, medical legal issues, insurance companies, they may ask so many things, but as a scientific person, what is the requirement? <laughs> if at the end of the day, you want a CT scan or you want an MRI? Do you ever want an MRI? It depends. I think I think it depends on the patient. If you have a rugby player that you've got a distinctive, you know, injury, he fell, dislocated his shoulder. It's obvious. X-rays. There's no bony lesion, no obvious bony lesion. He has a back right? No doubt. You know, I I, I I don't need any scan or anything. You know, we will go and operate on him. Okay. But if you've got this patient which is you know, didn't have really really trauma and is dislocating and I'm, you're not really sure what's going on, right. then you want to do an out to MRI. Yeah, yeah, but you don't have to deal with insurance companies in, in UK. You know how lucky you don't know how lucky you are. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult. So this panel is not very sure about the CT scan. <laughs> the CT if, scan if, if if you have a bony lesion, then you get I a CT scan. scan. Yes. yes. That's what I'm saying. If I have a bony lesion. But, but because if I don't see the bony lesion on the X-rays. 
it's not a significant bony lesion, full stop. But if, the, if there's no bony bank cards, it could be still an erosive loss or the, you know, in, in UK they might come, you know, within, let's say, two dislocation, three dislocation. Here the people will come and say, I don't remember. Yeah, but then you will see on, on, on an MR arteries, you'll see it on the, in the MR arterogram. Then if you have a query about that, do a CT scan. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but the uh, final comment is that you can see the bony, the bony defect in the MRI. You can, yeah. You yes. can, yeah. Yes. Yes. This helps a lot. Thank you, Dr. Kapil, for an uh, excellent talk, and we had an excellent discussion. Now, I'd like to call Dr. Amit Mishra, um, and his talk is on, on uh, types of anchors available, uh, quite important, pros and cons, composite types available, and methods to assist, cuff healing, future directions. Thanks, Vivek, and this is a last minute step in, so it's pretty basic. So why do we need a labral repair? I don't think that's uh, um, rocket science. The labrum increases the depth, the vertical diameter, the uh, width as well, and uh, acts as a strong anchor as such. And uh, the earlier times were pretty simple, and we wish they were as they were. Uh, this chap, he just put a hot iron rod in the axilla of a patient who he um, uh, found dislocated, and that solved the problem. That was the first dislocation. But we moved from there, and uh, we have moved to from, from drilling the bones to anchors uh, um, in the last, say, about 15 to 20 years as such. And there are various demands uh, on anchors in different scenarios. The instability scenario is a bit different from the cuff scenario because the in instability patient is a young patient, as Deep, uh, Deep Tiadla said, and um, uh, he has good bone stop. The glenoid is a small structure, so you need smaller anchors. And uh, as a part of the rehab process, basically, you do not immobilize them as much as you immobilize cuffs uh, for biological healing. And therefore, the stresses on this anchor in early rehab are pretty, pretty much uh, more. And pretty much the converse uh, in the rotator cuff scenario, you need larger anchors and you need something so that they could hold in osteoporotic bones. When anchors started, as in everything in interference screws and everywhere, we started with stainless steel, but we had a lot of problems uh, um, in revisions in identifying why these knees or why these shoulders failed. And of course, the pull-out strengths, uh, the pull-out strength being the strength with which this anchor would come out, the force that takes this anchor to come out, uh, was pretty low as compared to what we have today on shelves. And so just for that MRI bit, we moved from stainless steel anchors to ti titanium anchors, but again, we did not solve the problem of pull-out strength or adequate pull-out strength. We had problems uh, with revisions with metallic anchors, uh, um, and we had problems uh, when they did come out with loosening, migration, abrading the bone, causing arthritis, and so on and so forth. And those problems were solved when bioabsorbable anchors came, anchors that absorb in this hole over time. So that one problem was solved uh, if a biosoluble anchor after a certain period of time uh, did pull out or, or, or did loosen or was not placed properly, it after a certain period of time probably did not cause as much problem or so we thought at that time till we started understanding what these biosoluble anchors uh, are made of and started progressing in that direction. What is an ideal bioabsorbable anchor? It must have a good fix, as in everything, whether you fix fractures or you fix anything, the initial fix should be pretty good uh, and should be pretty rigid. So the initial fix should be pretty good, and it being bioabsorbable, it should serve its purpose and disappear away. So it should have good fixation strength, uh, good initial fixation strength, and then it should so, uh, sort of dissolve, so to say, uh, with time. So it should dissolve uh, roughly about the same time as your biological healing happens. And that's where uh, the mix and match uh, has happened in evolution of uh, composites uh, or, or, or what makes this biosol anchor. Some of them, some of the materials uh, do not disappear as quickly. Some disappear very quickly. So they disappear much before biological healing and that fix biologically can happen. So we 
we, we, uh, as part of the bioabsorbable anchors, uh, the material that was used uh, um, in earlier years, or I wouldn't say two earlier years, but uh, in the evolution it is early, was uh, polyglycolic acid, PGA. And PGA, in that balance, uh, lost its, uh, um, um, uh, it disappeared quickly. So there was an early loss of fixation strength, whereas uh, the polylactic acid that was used uh, was too slow to degrade. So it lasted a lot after the biological healing happened. And uh, when they last uh, very long, what they cause is an inflammatory response. Uh, and an inflammatory response just walls off uh, this hole, and you have nothing but uh, um, inflammation, synovitis, and uh, a walled off area where bone can't grow at all. So you have uh, for example, if it was an ACL, you had this area where the graft took up, when it was petlar tendons, and hamstrings, and another area where you had nothing at all, basically. So this problem of both inflammation and synovitis as a result of these materials and that loss of space, you, you, you could use that empty space as a, a space where the graft could fix as well, or in this case, the labrum or the cuff could fix as well, uh, was need, needed to be addressed. And how did we address this over time? by addition of certain materials which consisted of calcium and phosphate. So by adding something like as uh, uh, like tri-calcium phosphate, what one did was uh, induce some osteoinduction. And this osteoinduction progressed to uh, one cell after the other growing in that area and a process known as osteoconduction. We won't, we won't go into the details of that, but the the end result of it being that this empty hole uh, did fill up over time. So you had a much more rigid fix over the years uh, as this uh, anchor dissolved. What did calcium and phosphate do by uh, adding to these materials was uh, to increase the pH of uh, the entire environment in which this healing process was happening. What did PLLA and PGA do? They created an acidic environment. Besides, uh, and that acidic environment uh, evoked an inflammatory response, as I said, and that walled off this area, and you couldn't have bone grow into this area. What did TCP do? It, because it increased the pH, it, it brought a balance between the acidic and alkali, brought it to neutral, and you did not have this inflammatory response, or you did not have as much an inflammatory response. The area did not wall off, and you had enough time for bone to induce into this area. So the current materials, uh, and we have moved from here as well, um, the current materials uh, did add TCP, tri-calcium phosphate, in various proportions, and you have various anchors in the market um, by various names, depending upon the proportion of the TCP with the PLLA or the proportion of the TCP with the PGA. And that's one example of how things progress say, over 24 months. Uh, the bottom left slide shows you that this anchor has completely resolved. So you have this space which is filled with bone as against the bottom right where you did not have the TCP component in it. We progress from there and uh, we progress from there with the, uh, with the right sided list, the peak anchors. Uh, now these peak anchors do not absorb they do, and because they're, they're, they're bio inert and therefore the inflammatory and synovitis bit of it basically has been solved, but they remain there and uh, can be drilled over in a revision process. So the problems with the metallic anchors have been obviated by having peak out there where you can drill and redo a surgery as well. They're MRI compatible, so the problems with the metallic anchors have been obviated as well. Lately, what we do have are the all suture anchors. I don't have any experience with them, but it was just last night that I uh, sort of had a talk with the uh, Offer and Offer has had uh, an experience with uh, one of these uh, all suture anchors. What are these? They don't consist of any biocomposite material. They do not con consist of any metallic material. They're simply sutures that are driven into. I don't know how they're driven into, though. Uh, I tried to understand from him how, how they are. Uh, couldn't do so. But uh, I gave up understanding when he told me that two out of his five anchors have failed, and he's given up this as well. So a failure rate of 40% at this early stage uh, doesn't... Uh, you know, elicit uh, any stimulus to learn that. But we still have to see how the Y0 and the Juggernaut 2 perform uh, in large volumes, and that could probably be a way ahead without the muddle of having, having any composite 
creating an inflammatory response or creating problems with the revisions. What are the ideal suture characteristics, the suture that comes out of this anchor? You want the suture characteristics of all sutures that we normally use in open surgery, plus you also want a greater strength for the same standard size, and you want an easy handling property, a low friction surface conducive to tying. And I won't go into details, but uh, you just see the yellow portion, orthocord being one of the sutures, better for absorbable anchors, and fiber wire, fiber wire for metallic anchors. Thank you very much for your patience. Experience on uh, <coughs> the anchors available with the Indian companies? Yeah. Or so, uh, what I personally use is uh, the Helix, and uh, this is one of the biosorb anchors as such. The Helix has a component of TCP and has 30% TCP and 70%, uh, I don't know, PLLA or PGA, one of them. So, it serves the purpose at about three years. There have been various studies done in about three, or three years, uh, something like 38 months. You have at least about 80% of them. Uh, that do fill, and that's just, they do fill. How much do they fill? About just 10% of those fill completely. So um, we just have, say, something like about 8% or 6% of them where the entire hole is filled out of the 100% that we operate. But uh, at least we have some fill in 80% of them. I mean, I was asking about the, the anchors that are manufactured by the Indian companies. Oh, you mean Indian companies? Well. Uh, I only use metallic anchors used by, uh, uh, by, by Indian companies, and uh, they certainly do have a lower pull-out strength, uh, because uh, at the time of surgery, it's uh, been, uh, I would say, at least about 5 to 10 percent of the cases that the anchor does sort of come out, if you give a and big tug. And the anchors which are double-loaded, triple-loaded features? Uh, yeah, so that does not affect the healing properties as such, basically. It, uh, it certainly has a very, very important role in our practice. Uh, in that you can probably bring down the costs. And again, last night I was uh, uh, sort of uh, very, uh, very amused to hear that uh, offer uses simply one anchor. And that's probably is, uh, the way ahead, because just one of these last meetings uh, uh, three days ago at San Parmanand, uh, it was sort of presented that uh, there have been studies where three anchors certainly do better than two. Um, and uh, though the studies weren't quoted, but that was the sort of general consensus of one of the panels. and. Uh, that increased my cost because I normally use two, one at the 5.30 and one at the 3 o'clock position. Um, but one anchor alone, uh, double or triple loaded, uh, if that does the job, that certainly has a lot of relevance to practice in this country. I think uh, in, um, in bank cards, some people use uh, double loaded anchors which are available by MyTech uh -huh. on double stand. You take quite a low 6 o'clock bite and then, you know, coming a little up. Whereas in Rotator Cuff, we have all double loaded. Um, I think MyTech and the uh, Arthrex, they make triple loaded. And MyTech Peak triple loaded is a fantastic anchor, especially it comes when it comes to our country. And in fact, in abroad also, where number of anchors, if you increase, not all insurance companies are approving all the anchors. So sometimes, just a little bigger than the small size tier, where you feel one more bite would have been better. Yeah. Uh, a triple loaded is a fantastic option. Yeah, you put a triple loaded anchor, it gives you more bite. And as per Snyder's recommendation, what he says, number of bites are also equally important as compared to the number of anchors. So if you have one triple loaded and one double loaded, you get total five bites. Or if you have two triple loaded anchors, you get six bites. Rather than putting three anchors, taking a lot of bone area. And then in case, if you have to revise in future, you are completely lost. Sure. And I would, would love to just make a comment and a question. Uh, we've been using in Brazil in the last two or three years the peak anchors to cuffs. And we are, ma we are having many, 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 many problems. They break. And so uh, we, are, we, are, we are really not uh, happy with this. And I would like to know if, if someone is using peak anchors and if he is, if, if he is having such problems. Yeah? I use peak anchors for my lateral row in the cuff, but for the medial row, I don't use peak anchors. I, in fact, I, I, so I said peak anchors I use for the lateral row. Yeah. For the medial row, I started using bioabsorbables, but the problem with that was, you know, I'm sure all of us have been there where you break an anchor trying to find the correct hole, you haven't tapped on the bone is hard enough, 
or you're going for the extra one more turn and you hear a bad squeak and there it goes. So now I use metallic anchors for middle row cups and peak for the what? lateral row. Peak, I had a little problem with peak they, for the lateral row. They don't break? Not for the lateral row, no. Okay. Because I use the pound and peak anchors, you know, okay. uh, but not the screw and peak anchors, but the pound and peak anchors. Okay. For bankers? Levy? For bankers, I, uh, for bankers, I use uh, knotless anchors. Uh, I use peak knotless anchors from Arthrex, the push locks. I used to use 3.5s, now I'm going to 2.9s. I have the same experience. I use it for lateral row. It's uh, one that you lock the the the, the knots inside. Yeah. It. yeah. I ones from different companies, but um, just a lateral row. But no problems. Mm, didn't have much problem. Well, I, some some of them broke. You know, when you insert them, if you don't, if you're not really in the right angle, but very few. I don't okay. think of any major problems. And just one. But but for one. the stability, instability, I have. A concern using the peak anchors in in the glenoid. The same concern that I have using uh, metallic anchors on the glenoid because uh, and it's actually worse than metallic because in the metallic ones you can see on X-rays. Sure. Peak you can't see on X-rays. And even absorbable. And if, and if you leave them, the absorbable will, will dissolve eventually. But yeah. But the peak one will not dissolve and continue to to uh, to, to create to a synovitis and chondrolysis and so on. A problem on the on the human head. Yeah. Okay. And just w just w w one thing that I think is important that uh, yeah I as I understood you didn't mention uh, about the angle of approach to put <laughs> the anchors in the in the rotator cuff sutures. Dr. Eiji Itoi from Japan has made a lot of, of studies in this, but his conclusions is this is this uh, the the best angle would be theoretically if you can because some some, some sometimes I I have to fight with the uh, a chromium it would be 45. So uh, if you put the anchor like this, it's different than putting like this. So do you have these concerns in your practice? Yeah, I just follow the dead man's angle, the 45 degree in any yeah. case, yeah. Okay. And uh, that probably biomechanically is uh, uh, proved I, to I, be... I think that for the audience, this is important uh, message. Not, yeah. not, not only the anchor, but the angle of insertion. The angle of the insertion. What is also important is uh, double versus triple loaded. I mean, uh, if you're an early arthroscopist or you're just starting uh, practice, certainly don't use the double loaded because uh, suture management can be pretty confusing. You know, so, so that certainly you need to balance that with the cost. I think uh, this uh, I can tell you. Uh, the as far as Indian anchors are concerned, or any other anchors are concerned, avoid using them unless and until you are very sure about their biomechanical properties, like pull-out strength and material properties. Because remember, shoulder or knee or any arthroscopic surgery, they are to be done in such a way that this is the, the surgery, the final surgery. You do something, you mess up, yep. then the revisions are extremely difficult and these sutures are known to break, uh, they are known to pull out and uh, I think none of the Indian companies or the local companies for that matter, some Chinese, they are not making anything bio. They're at the no, they are not making any. And they have got very pathetic sutures, poor pull out, so it is much better to use the the one which are standardized and at the moment in Indian market the cheapest anchor as far as cost is concerned is from Stryker. So you can use and they have got fantastic force fiber uh, threads which are look exactly look alike like a Smith and Nephew. Yeah, yeah. So one of the major the problems with Indian anchors was that uh, uh, more than the pull out is basically they don't uh, embed completely at times. And that's because they can't make the metal of the inserter strong enough to you know kind of drive it in. It uh, it's it's a it could be a disposable or non non disposable driver, and that just sort of deforms yes. around the head of the anchor. Sure. So you have some anchors stuck up, and I've been uh, I've got stuck once or twice. So I took another anchor medially, hoped that that would embed, and it covered the previous anchor with the labrum itself. Okay. Um, thank you, Amit, for thank the excellent uh, talk. So our next uh, lecture is my two arthroscopic knots. I would like to, to ask Dr. Pratik Gupta, please. Thank you so much, Sajju. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of, uh, of ICON and uh, Dr. Amit to invite me to speak in front of such an August gathering here. Are we okay for the... Yeah. Okay. No, I think uh, it is cutting off. Uh, 
we have to end this show and then <coughs> Sorry for yeah, we are working to for invite me. Um, I wish to thank Amit once again to speak in front of uh, such an August gathering. Uh, not. Uh, not we as a human being have been associated for a long time and time immemorial we've been using knots for our benefit in sailing and in fishing but as an established orthopedic surgeon this is a basic skill needed for any arthroscopic work especially shoulder work the knot in uh, shoulder is slightly different that it has to be formed at a distance and then has to be tightened at the level of the target tissue now this is the most important factor is to maintaining the tension uh, at the site while you are actually giving the rest of your half inches to uh, secure the knot. It is even more important than what type of knot you use. So an effective knot should be properly formed so that the suture does not slip or cut on itself and it must be easily tightened to ensure maximum strength. Now if you look around uh, what all is available, basically they can be actually divided into two kinds of knots that are there which we need to know about. It's the uh, static or non-sliding knot and the sliding knot. The non-sliding knot are used when the two limbs of the suture are not freely sliding through the tissue or the anchoring device. Now this we come across very often, uh, or not very often, but many times when we're stuck and the limbs are not moving, then this kind of knot comes handy. The disadvantage is that there is a propensity for the loop to loosen while you are actually putting the half hitches which will provisionally lock the knot. So this, when you are using this knot, one has to be careful about that. This is not the problem with the sliding knot which are used when the limbs are freely moving through the suture tissue, uh, soft tissue and the suture anchor. Here, by just pulling on the post, one can maintain the tension by the time you put the half hitches, which will actually secure the knot. So we looked at what would be a good knot. To understand the knot, there are two concepts in the knot security, in the security of a knot, which is the loop security and the knot security. The loop security is a security wherein where once you put the initial loop into the tissue so its ability to maintain the tight suture loop as the knot is tied so when you take the first bite and you put the loop and it's holding the tissues together it should maintain that tension and approximation while you're putting your rest of your half hitches while the knot security is ability of a completed knot to resist the slippage and therefore loosening so once your knot is complete it should not slip an ideal knot will have the uh, good balance of both loop security as well as knot security and should be reproducible in hand of an average orthoped, uh, orthopedic and arthroscopic surgeon. We look at the literature, most of them were looking at the knot security, only few evaluated loop and knot security. This one article from Burkhardt actually looked at the six uh, arthroscopic knots, uh, uh, sliding knots and uh, surgeon's knot, uh, which is a static knot to look at both loop security and knot security and also the roles of reverse half hitches with alternative post as to how they affect the knot. And they found that the increasing knot security was found as compared, this is the graph when there were no three half hitches and reverse uh, um, alternating post. And when you do that, this knot security uh, becomes very, uh, very much increased and the knot security is improved. Similarly, the loop security also was the same. The, the moment you, uh, when you were not using the three half hitches uh, with alternate post, without that, the loop security was poorer as compared when you were using them. Also in this study, they found that the fiber wire, because of the friction between the wires, uh, actually gives a better uh, uh, knot security uh, as compared to using a normal ethibond, which all of us have actually experienced in our practice. We started with uh, ethibond and then we found that these were giving a better uh, knot security. And in this study, they found the surgeon's knot was the maximum uh, loop and knot security, while the sliding knot, Rhodes and Duncan loop actually gave that best. But what was important is three half hitches with alternating post. They actually give the best security. Now coming to the uh, arthroscopic uh, knot tying, uh, one as an, uh, an arthroscopic surgeon should be proficient with one or the other, one static and one sliding knot so that we can come out of any situation that we are there. In uh, my hand, we were using Revo knot 
wherein we use, as you will see in this video, because uh, Ahmed wanted uh, animation, so uh, we did one ourselves. We use three underhand half hitches, uh, two initially underhand half hitches, which are seated. Now you see where the first half hitch goes, the, uh, it tends to slip. Then we put another underhand half hitch. Now that gives a little bit of security uh, to that knot, some knot formation. But it is the third half hitch which is reverse. Now that will be overhand. That actually gives some security to the knot. But still you will see when I push it down, it is not as secure. This is the third uh, half hitch which is, now you can see it did back out. Uh, and this was overhand. Now we reverse <coughs> the half hitch underhand. And what is most important is the switching of the post. Now at the moment the post is where our knot pusher is, but we will change the post. You will see it will change <coughs> now. And then we deliver the, uh, the half hitch. And when we pass point, that locks the knot. This is followed by another two half hitches with alternating post, and that secures the knot quite well. As for the sliding knot is concerned, Duncan loop is what uh, 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 one can use. As I said, one can use any. Here we've got a sliding loop, so we only uh, take, uh, make the post small, and the other uh, suture is used to form a loop, and then it goes around the two sutures three times, and then pass through the loop. And this forms here the Duncan loop. Now here it is very important to address the uh, loop properly so that all the three throws sit nicely, uh, one after the other, on your post limb. And then by simple pull of the post, the knot can be delivered onto the target tissue. Now this knot can be sealed with a reverse half hitch, as you would see here, maintaining the tension on the post. And when the half hitch sits there, it secures the knot, but it can further be secured by reverse half hitch and also alternating the post. You will see in a second, the post will be altered from without changing the, um, uh, uh, yeah, there it, it, it was changed. Without actually uh, taking out your uh, knot pusher, you can just uh, change the post. And once that is in position, that is locked, and then two more half hitches to secure that. So those are the two knots. As I said, one has to be very careful uh, that the one has to be very proficient. One sliding and one um, uh, static notch, uh, knot would do well. Now, also I was asked to comment on, as we were talking about, whether the knotless is the way forward and whether the knot tying is still art that we need to know. We looked through the literature and still jury is out. There is no convincing evidence that knotless uh, would perform better. In fact, there are certain studies here this is from 2010, where they looked both and they found that the knotless device required less single load to displace 2 mm. And all of us know that if it is 2 mm plus or 2 mm or 2 mm plus, then our repair is jeopardized to a large extent. This is study as close as last year, where they looked at all soft. We were just talking about the Jagger knot, and um, 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 Amit was uh, sharing the experience of offer, and they also found that same thing that. The biomechanical studies show that the design is susceptible to micro motion and early gap formation. So there is a slippage in the uh, in the suture, uh, which again also uh, beared through the another study, 2012, where this they went on to comment that the knotless suture anchor actually appears quick and easy to perform, but however, the most of the anchor system <coughs> could not even reach half of the anchor pullout strength uh, uh, from bone before the suture slippage occurred. So it was not the pull-out strength which is a problem. It is this uh, slippage of the of the suture, uh, which is actually uh, dogging uh, not less suture anchor. And till such time that we are able to actually uh, get over this problem and improve on this, I feel knot tying still remains as a basic skill which all the arthroscopic surgeons should have as a gold standard. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pratik, for an excellent, basic, and a brief talk. Uh, any questions, <coughs> Dr. Offer? Just, a, just a comment about the the, the knotless anchors. Just a little thing that um, you know, there are knotless anchors they use to fix or to 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 fix the the suture within the anchor, and now the ones that are fixing the the suture between the anchor and the bone. 
if you have to rely on the bone to hold the suture, I think at the end you you lose. You need something that you fix the, the suture in, in in the anchor because the bone usually in the cuff is a soft bone and the micro motion between the suture between the suture, the anchor and the bone will loosen the suture. So just a, a point yeah. to remember. So new forward way is to to the suture to lock within, within the, anchor the anchor as we are getting more and more uh, you know drive in screws which actually lock in the outer and the inner um, uh, screws yeah. together. Yeah. Sure. I think uh, one very important uh, comment regarding the knot tying is, as uh, Dr. Pratik has really pointed out, first and foremost is the loop security, followed by you know putting your knots in such a way that they really, really get locked and do not get slipped you know, during the cyclical motion in the rehab program. Uh, but one of the very important thing in the shoulder arthroscopy is the vision should be absolutely clear when you are tying the knot. And you should not tie the knot if you cannot see, because sometimes there will be loops and it will be twisted and you will be thinking that you have done your best job but in fact there were too many loops already, twists already and the loop, even though the loop security was fine, the, the knot security may not be good and then further on it will be a failed thing. Especially those who do the subscape repair, you cannot see with the 30 degree scope what are you tying in front. So the vision should be absolutely clear before you start tying the knot, you can clear up the space once more. Yeah, and keep testing for the uh, for the beginners. Keep push, putting your knot pusher down to the to the level to see that all is clear. There's nothing as uh, Vivek was pointing out that the the, you, the, the last uh, knot that you have the hitch you have sent has been delivered. Obviously, your vision will show you, and it's there. It's not stuck in between because that's happened to us once. Uh, it got stuck, and you know you you and if you throw in a second one, then you had it in oh, the middle. The yeah, yeah, it happened to me much more than. Once it happened many times until I, I learned of this. But one 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 last thing I would like to comment is that I don't know how things happen here in India or even in UK. But I think that all these these discussions are very important because in my country I receive I do everything to avoid it, but it is impossible. Many guys coming into my office and say, Hey doctor, I have a new anchor and this is a miracle. And they are the, the most best selling guys in the planet. So, uh, and I learned it with many guys, especially with Pascal Boalo, that we should not trust them and we should, uh, 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 in fact, discuss uh, scientifically between ourselves because they want to sell. And the industry is very, very aggressive, at least in the, in the United States and in my country, it's very aggressive. So, we should pay a lot of, of attention to what we are, we are discussing here because when these guys,